This being a web app, you had to know this was coming sooner or later. It's time to build a form. I know, I know, forms suck, but it's not so bad with Redwood. Check this out. Let's make a contact us page. You know, after this blog goes live, we're gonna be hit up by people all around the world wanting us to write content for them, and they need a way to get in touch with us. So let's make a contact page. So the first thing we'll do is generate a page. Getting used to that now. We'll call it contact. And let's make a way to get to the contact page. Let's add a link in our navigation. So we'll go to our layout. We'll add an additional link here. And then in the routes, we'll make sure we put that into our set so it gets wrapped with our layout. Contact link, contact page. All right. So how do we build a form? Well, that's usually going to start with a form tag, right? But this isn't going to be a lowercase form. This is going to be a capital form. And let's import that. We don't need these links anymore. And what are we going to get from people? Let's get their name, their email, and then the message. And rather than an input, we're going to do a text field. And we'll give it a name, which is the name of the field as we're going to refer to it. This is going to have the person's name in it. So in this case, the name is name. And then we'll also have an email. And we'll have a message. We need to import these. Okay, we've got our three boxes. We probably want our message to be a little bit bigger. So let's import a text area field which gives us a taller box here that we can expand out. And right now we don't know, really know which field is which here. So let's add some labels. We'll say this is name. This is email. This is message. Okay, we can kind of tell which one is which now. Now we need a submit button. So rather than an input type equals submit, we just have a submit. And we'll say send message will be the label. And we have to import that. If we can click that button, nothing happens. Now what we need to do is say what happens when you click the submit button. And that's gonna go on the form tag. We're gonna say on submit. In this case, we'll just make a function name the same. On submit, and we'll put that up here. And this is going to get some data. And for now, we'll just console log this so we can see what it is. And if we want to be able to see this console log, we'll have to open up our web inspector. Ooh, look at that. We got an object with our three data fields. OK, so we got the basics working. So now let's see, what do we need to do here? We need to make some of these fields required, right? You shouldn't be able to submit this comment if there's no message or if there's no email or if there's no name, right? And if any of these are missing. Right now, it doesn't care. It just submits empty strings. So let's see what we can do about that. Well, we've got our regular HTML5 required attributes. We could say required. We could put that on all of these. And now if you try to submit, you get that, that's the HTML field validation. And that's all right, I guess. But can Redwood do something better? Let's see. Let's look at this. Let's look at validation equals. And then in here, we're going to say required true. Let's put this on all these fields. Now what happens? Well, there's no error message, but notice also nothing got submitted here. So something is stopping this from submitting. That's good. And if I fill these in, it does submit. OK, so something's going on there. Let's see, how can we get that error message? Well, we've got an additional field here we haven't shown yet. This is field error. And in this case, you give it the same name as the field you want to show the error for. So the, na the field named name, that's what we're going to show here. And this is just a self-closing tag. And we'll put one here, and we'll put one here. Except this one's going to be email, and this one's going to be message. And then we need to import it. And now what happens? Ooh, so now we're getting a little error message here. Now, it would be nice if we could style that, right? It's kind of tough to read in black. It would be nice if it was, like, a little bit more showy. So what if we put class name? 
is error. And this is going to come from, remember the style sheet we cheated and added? We have this error class here. Let's add that on each one of these. Ooh, so now that's red. Now, you know what would be kind of neat is if the field itself highlighted, right? So not just the message underneath, but like the field itself was highlighted red. So if we go into text field here, we have an error class name. So we're going to add this on all three of these. Ooh, now the field itself is red. Now what about that label? How do I get that label to be red? Well, to do that, what we need to do is use Redwood's label. So instead of lowercase label, we're going to do label. And then we need to give it the attribute name again. And it's going to be the same as the, the field it should sort of attach itself to. So name equals, and then also error class name. And this one's going to be email, and this one's going to be message. And then we need to import it. And now if we cause an error, ooh, the label, the field itself, and the error message are all nice and red. Great. So that's looking pretty good. Now, what about this? What if I put an invalid email address in here? And notice as I put in the right field, it highlight it removes the error class automatically. It's kind of nice. Oops. So that's considered valid for some reason, right? I mean, it shouldn't be because that email. So what else can we do about that? Well, let's look at our validation here and we can add one. We can say we got to validate the format of this. We give it a pattern. In this case, that's a regex. And this isn't necessarily going to be the most secure regex that has ever existed, but it's better than nothing. And let's make it look like this. And what this says is you can have any character that's not an at sign and then an at sign and then any character that's not a decimal and then a decimal and then some more characters, any character. That's a very basic validation for email address. So now if I do this, And look at that, the message says email is not formatted correctly, as opposed to this one, which was required. So then we say .com, now it is correct. And we can send, and there it is. The data is valid. All right, so that form's looking pretty good. Now let's get the data up to the server. So we need to save it to the database. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to our schema, and we're going to add a new database table to contain this. So we'll create the contact model. And again, it has an ID that's auto-incremented, has the name, the email, the message, and then it's going to put it created at timestamp when it was created. And then we're going to go back to Yarn, Redwood, Prisma, Migrate Dev. It asks us for the name. We'll call it Create Contact. And you'll see there it created another migration file. Database is now in sync. Now, when we did this with Post, we created a scaffold. So we got the CRUD pages to be able to put records in and out. But we've already kind of got our contact page. We don't really need the full on scaffold. Let's just create the backend services we need to actually get the data in and out of the database, right? Which is the SDL and the service. So if we do a yarn, Redwood, generate SDL contact, that'll create the SDL. And then an SDL also requires a service that'll automatically create the service for us. If we open up our contacts SDL here, we can see it did the same thing it did for posts. We got our contact, we got our two query types, contacts, and then a single contact. And our input types, create and update, and then our mutations for create, update, and delete. And then we can take a look at our service. And again, we've got contacts, contact, create, update, delete, ready to go. So in this case, we just need to use the create contact, because that's all you can do from the front end is just submit a new contact. And then in theory, later on, you'd create some kind of an admin page or some kind of email tie-in that notifies you every time someone sends you a contact. So now we need to tie our front end form into this GraphQL type here. Now. You might think you need to use a cell because it involves data at the database, but cells really are more for getting data out. If you need to put data in, that's where we're going to do a use mutation, which we're going to see in a minute. First thing we're going to do, though, is we're going to write our GraphQL to actually create the contact record. So we're going to make ourselves a query here, and we'll call it create contact. And it's just sort of a standard recommended way. You kind of make it a constant like this, so then it's all caps. And this is GQL. And then you got a mutation, and it's the create contact mutation that expects the create contact input, which looked like this. So it's going to expect a name, an email, and a message. And these have exclamation points, which means they are required. 
And then that's going to call the create contact endpoint given this input, and it's just going to return the ID. We're not, ever, we're not even going to show anything to the front end with what's returned by this mutation, so we can kind of ignore that, but you have to return something. Okay, so now what do we do with that query? So now we're going to use a use mutation. And that says we're going to want to use this mutation query and pass it our data. We'll just call it create, and it's use mutation, and then you give it the name of the query you just created. So this is create contact. So now this function will invoke this GraphQL. And where do you invoke it? You're going to invoke it in this on submit. Instead of just showing it in the web inspector, we're actually going to submit it to the server. So we can leave that console log there just for debugging to make sure it worked. But now we're going to call our create function. And then when you do this with GraphQL, you're going to create an object. And the first member is going to be called variables. And then remember, it wants this input type. So that's input. And then the actual data, which would be like name, Rob, email. But we already have that perfectly structured in this data object. So we'll just say input is data. All right, let's see if it works. So come back over here, say Rob. And, well, we can't tell. This worked. It's still console logged, but it, did it go to the database? Let's find out. Uh, we actually have a neat tool here Prisma gives us called Prisma Studio. So we're going to say Yarn Redwood Prisma Studio. And this gives us a little database GUI that we can look into our database and see if that actually worked. You see it open up a new tab. So look at, there's our contact model. Ooh, and there's one record in there. And sure enough, that's the one we just made. So we come back over here and do another one. And we come back to Prisma Studio and we refresh. And there's Tom. That wasn't so bad, huh? Is there a way we can improve this? Well, right now there's nothing stopping you from sending message two or three or four times while it's in the middle of sending. For example, if we went in here and slowed down our network, let's give ourselves slow 3G. And if I submit, 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 I can submit. See, these, these haven't even returned yet from the server. And I submitted a bunch more. So let's disable that button while it's in the middle of sending. We can get a couple more properties here from use mutation. And we're going to destructure them like this. We can get loading. So this will be true while the mutation is in process, and then it'll be false once it stops. So what we can do is we can look at that loading and say, okay, if you're currently loading, then we're going to disable the submit button. And then we're going to say disabled equals loading. So if it's loading, it'll be disabled. If it's not loading, it won't be. And what we can do is come back over here, and then let's temporarily turn this off. Otherwise, it takes forever to reload this just in case. Turn it back on. It's disabled while the request is in process. And then when, once it finishes and comes back, then it stops. So disabled, 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 re-enabled. All right, what else can we do? Well, there's no indication that we sent the message, right, that it actually worked. We saw that before. We had to look, go and look in the database to see that it showed up. So what if we give the users a little message here? Redwood includes React Hot Toast, which shows little toast notifications. It looks like a little piece of toast popping out of a toaster at the top of the page. So let's use those. So I'll come up here and we'll do another import. So there's toaster, which is the actual UI that displays the toast message. And then there's toast, which is the function you call when you want to show a message. I'm going to import that from web slash toast and then you decide where you want to show it. And you can actually put this toaster anywhere, but it, and by default, it'll show at the top of the page. So we're just going to say toaster. It's going to go right there. And then we need to actually send the message. So where do we do that? There's no, it doesn't appear to be any hooks here that say that the request is finished, correct? There's this loading, but we don't know if it's false because he hasn't started loading yet or it's false because it already finished loading. Well, it turns out there's another parameter you can pass in here and you can pass an object with some options. And one of them is uncompleted. And that's a function that gets called when the request is done. So in here, we can say toast success. Thank you for your, for your message. And now let's see. There we go. Thank you for your message. That looks pretty good. What else can we do? Well, you may have noticed there's nothing stopping us from doing this. Submit, 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 submit. So what we should probably do is after you send your message, let's clear these fields out so you can't just immediately send another one. And do that, what we need to do is reset the form fields. And there's a built-in JavaScript function for doing that. 
but we don't have access to it by default. So what we need to do is we need to actually get the underlying form library that we use, use form. And this comes from React hook form. So by doing this here, we can get access to this directly. So we're gonna input use form. And behind the scenes, we're using React hook form. And what we need to do is we need to take the form methods that it would normally give us. This usually happens for you behind the scenes, but if you wanna use something like this reset, you kinda of need to do this manually. So you're gonna save off these form methods and then you're gonna pass them into the form here. And then once you do that, the form keeps working as it does, but now we also have access to stuff like reset. So in here, when it completes, it's not only gonna show the message, but now it's going to form methods reset. And now if we fill out our form, get the message and it clears out our form for us. Great. Now, if you've been building forms for a while, you may have heard the old axiom, never trust the client. Since the user has access to the client code, they could potentially go in behind the scenes while the page is running and remove our validations. So they could actually potentially remove this in the compiled JavaScript, then it wouldn't actually check that it's an email address, and then they might try to submit up bad data. So you really need to check all this data on the server as well. And the GraphQL, the SDL file that we have, is already checking that these fields are required, right? So we don't really need to worry about that. GraphQL won't let these through if you don't submit these. However, it doesn't know anything about email address that it must be an email. So what can we do about that? Well, Redwood has a couple built-in features for validating data on the server side. We call them service validations. We're gonna import a function, validate from Redwood JS API, and that's gonna let us validate fields as they come in. And this is gonna go in the create contact, and we're gonna say validate, and then you give it the field you wanna check. So you wanna check input email, and then the name of the field on the front end, right, which is email and our name attribute. And then how you want to validate. In this case, we want to validate that as an email. So that's using the word email a lot. But again, this is the value you want to check, the name of the field on the front end, and then the type of validation you want to apply. And there's several other kinds of validators. This one just happens to be called email. And it's not going to do, it, do us any good right now because it already is formatted as an email by the time it goes up to the server. But let's cheat and we'll say, let's remove this pattern check here. So we'll remove that. And now potentially a bad email could get up to the server. So now what happens if we fill this out? So let's fill out a bad email address and send it. See, we didn't get an error here because we removed that validation on the front end. But if you look at our GraphQL request, we did get something happened here. So response, ooh, email must be formatted like an email address. That's pretty close to what we want, but we need to display it here. And the way we can do that is we got to destructure one more thing out of our use migrations. We have loading and there's also error. So if there's server errors are returned, they're gonna be in here, but then we also need to get those to our form. So we're gonna come in here and say error equals error. And then we'll submit this. And now that error is showing up, it's populated right in there, just like our, our client side errors. There's one more little form helper we can add to call it our errors even clearer. We can come in here and create this form error component. And we need to make sure we import it. And what this will do is give us a nice summary of our errors at the top of the page. So now if we come back here, do this. Errors prevented this form from being saved. Email must be formatted like an email address. So that highlights that. And then as you scroll down, you'll see that it's actually highlighted on the actual form field as well. Now that was just one kind of server validation. We have a whole bunch. So as an example, here's a few more. Let's say we had a website where you could submit your car for sale, but we only wanted to allow the creme de la creme of cars. So we might have our create car endpoint. And we have a whole bunch of validations here. For example, the make must be included in this list and the color cannot be one of these and also provide a custom message when it's not rather than just the default would say, you know, color is not in list beige mauve. We wanna make sure that the car does not have any damage. So if this input is present, that's bad. That would throw an error. And we wanna check it's a valid VIN number. So we make sure the format matches a certain regular expression and that the length is exactly 17 characters. And finally, in this case, we want to make sure the odometer is a positive number, but less than or equal to 10,000 miles. So there are plenty of service validations you can add and combine in various ways to get your data just right before it gets into the database. So that's it. Maybe forms aren't so bad anymore. Hmm. Okay, that's it for chapter three. Come on back for chapter four.